Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Today we also kick off our annual membership drive. Many of you have already committed to recruiting two new members between now and March 31st. And on behalf of City Club, I thank you. If others still would like to join the membership team, please fill out the form in the bulletin and return it to the club office. With us today to tell us about this year's membership campaign is Ann Disgeier of our membership task force. Ann? Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see so many non-member guests here today, and this is a great way to kick off our annual membership drive. As Harriet noted, starting today through the end of March, members of the Board, Board of Governors and the Membership Task Force, as well as other volunteer members, have each pledged to recruit two new members. And I will say I've got a friend in the audience, so I've just got to got all the membership information with him, and Dan's going to join up, and that's the first of my new members. Okay? Now I've definitely intimidated him. To reach our goal of 125 new members in the next two months, I would like to challenge each member here today to join this endeavor and to share City Club with a friend. For February and March, we've waived the $25 new member processing fee and will announce in the bulletin and here at the Friday programs each week the names of new members and their recruiters. In addition, these members and their recruits will be invited to a special new member reception in April. In the middle of the table are pledge cards asking you to join our recruiting team. Filled out with the cards can be returned to Suzanne after the program or just mailed into the City Club office. You will also find membership applications on each table and in the back of the room, the table over there. I encourage all of our non-member guests here to pick one up. I encourage our members keep a few on hand during February and March and make a special effort. Each one of you has gone, has known the value of City Club, what it's been to you, and what the future holds. And I think sharing that with a friend is a wonderful way to enhance the value of the City Club experience. Thank you very much, and we look forward to a successful membership drive. Sam. Our membership today at the head table is Carol Witherell. Carol is Professor of Education at Lewis and Clark College. Following Carol's question, as always, we will open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone even before Carol is finished asking her question so that we might have time for as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your questions in 30 seconds or less, or the Charlie Davis prompt up here. <laughs> Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacific Air, Hope and Talbot Incorporated, and Zimmer Gunzel Frasca Partnership. As always, we are very grateful for their ongoing support. The City Club's mission is to inform members and the community in public matters and to arouse in them a realization in the obligation of citizenship. It is in this context that we might choose to look at our support of the arts as a canary in the coal mine. One of my colleagues, who is a composer and critic, talks about the challenges of composing in terms of mental agility and imagination problem solving, and taking risks by pushing out ideas as far as they will go. Friends of his, who are mathematicians and physicists, tell him that there is a deep connection between his creative process and their modes of thinking. And I was struck by the fact that we certainly don't hear many raised voices advocating cutbacks in the teaching of math and science. 
At their core, the arts are about the ascendancy of ideas, about asking questions and thinking critically. As such, they contribute immeasurably to the common good and to the healthy functioning of a free democratic society. Jane Alexander, when she chaired the National Endowment for the Arts, would often say that the power of art lies not in the development of a skill, although that is significant in and of itself, nor in its ability to reach us emotionally, eliciting laughter or tears, shock or diffidence. The power of art, she said, is its revelation that human potential is limitless. But most of the people in this room can talk with much more knowledge and authority on these matters than I can. Today's speaker, George Thorne, most certainly can. George Thorne is co-director of Arts Action Research, a national arts consulting group currently working on the Capital Initiative, an ambitious public-private effort to secure a strong financial base and to grow future audiences for Portland's arts community. Prior to his decade-long association with Arts Action Research, he directed the graduate program in Arts Administration at Virginia Tech, served as Executive Vice President of the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, and spent 16 years in New York managing Broadway, Off-Broadway, and touring companies. He's here today to help us think broadly about the arts, first in a national context, and then to share his perspective on the arts environment in Portland. George. Harry, thank you for that uh, welcome and the, uh, putting this presentation in context. I would also like to thank the City Club for extending the invitation for this presentation. The Speakers Committee who supported it and particularly Jamie Armstrong, who shepherded me through the process. And a particular thanks to Lee Stevenson Kuhn, whose impulse was the genesis of this moving forward. So Lee, thank you. If it doesn't go well, uh, you can all come to Lee. If it goes well, you can certainly come to me. So that would be good. Um, I was wondering today, with all the sun breaks, at which time did the ground ball come out? <laughs> Did it come out during a sunbreak or when it was pouring rain? <laughs> I guess that's where we were. Or uh, where we were in the city at that time. Um, at first, when uh, this presentation was scheduled between the mayor's state of the city address and the governor's state of the state address, uh, I was feeling somewhat intimidated about being sort of sandwiched between those two. But the more I thought about it, I thought how really appropriate it is that the state of arts and culture, that arts and culture serves as the connection and the bridge between the state of the city and the state of the state. Because we must have, which Harry has uh, uh, communicated very well, arts and culture must be at the center of a healthy, productive society. So if we take the metaphor even further about a sandwich, in a sense it's arts and culture that supplies the meat, if you will, it supplies the spice, it supplies the content, that makes a city and a state uh, a healthy and productive place to live. So I think it's, a, it's very appropriate that we are the connected tissue, if you will, between those two. Uh, today's presentation will be in three parts. The first part is uh, my uh, assessment of the national environment for arts and culture, as well as several elements within that environment which are having very extraordinary effect on the life of arts and culture organizations. The second part will then be to take that national context and give you my perspective of arts and culture in Portland. And then the third part will be to talk about a strategy that's in place, the Capital Initiative, to begin to address some of those challenges. Uh, first, the uh, national environment for arts and culture. My view of this is formed because I travel about 15 to 20 days a month working with arts organizations nationally. Uh, New York, Toronto, Philadelphia, North Carolina, Monday and Tuesday in Seattle. We just keep going that way and make three, sometimes four, cross-country trips a month in this work. Uh, so my comments on this are really informed by that. To give you some size, of, some sense of the size and scale of arts action research, the firm I do this work through, because of arts action research's concern and commitment to the arts in Portland, 
They've sent half the corporations here today. <laughs> the other half of the corporations, my partner, Nella McDaniel, he and I have been collaborating together for almost 20 years. So in this, when I talk about the we, it's not the royal we, it's the we of Nell and myself as a working partnership. So I just wanted to make sure it didn't seem so ostentatious, I kept saying we. So how, how would I describe the environment for arts and culture nationally? I would describe, we would describe the environment as ranging from volatile to hostile. Those terms aren't meant to be inflammatory but descriptive. We live in very, very volatile times. Times and change is happening so rapidly. Uh, it used to be that death, taxes, and change was, and death and taxes were the, the givens. Now it's death, taxes, and change. That, that, that the rate of change is moving so quickly. Uh, and I think that perhaps the greatest challenge to arts and culture organizations is how do you continue to produce, present, and exhibit art and culture? How do you, con how do you continue to connect that to communities and audiences? And how do you continue to support that through contributing income when times are so changing and so volatile. So the challenge is how to move forward positively and creatively with flexibility and adaptability when times are so incredibly complex and changing. Um, I, I know each of us, I'm sure, I know I feel that way. I think most arts and culture organizations feel the same way. I know occasionally, I was just like, couldn't I just get a little period of time where there's this island of stability and you could count on things and the planes would take off and land on time and all those things. I know we all hunger for that and it's not, I don't think we're gonna have that ever again. So I think for all of us, both personally and professionally, how do we find our way through this rapidly changing environment? Uh, I think it's also important to note that obviously this is not just an arts issue. Every sector of our society is going through extraordinary change, rapid change, and change that's coming at us that we almost can't absorb it. Uh, I spend a lot of my time working with arts organizations, working with board members, and so I get to meet an awful lot of people in other professions. I'm always curious about how other professions work. I think I know how our profession works. And so you talk to anyone in another profession, uh, the change is so extraordinary. Healthcare, or the generation of power, or uh, manufacturing, communications, whatever. So I think we have to see the arts are a part of this total landscape. What are some elements that exist in this landscape that are having enormous effect on arts and culture organizations? Uh, normally, I would talk about 10 or 12 elements in the environment. I'm only going to talk about four today, so it, it won't go because of the time, uh, the time factor, but I will talk about four elements that are having enormous effect. The first element in the, in the environment that's having enormous effect has, is the continued devalue of the role, value, and function of art and culture at the center of a healthy society. We keep marginalizing art and culture further and further away from the center of a healthy society. And this has been going on for about a 15 or 20 year period. Uh, we see it, you know, uh, we see it in so many ways. Certainly when we listen to state of the city and state of the state addresses, how many times is art and culture included in that? When decision making process is going on in a community, people are called to the table how selling arts and cultural forces are called to the table. We see that measured in a number of ways. I've worked my entire lifetime in this profession. I never believed I would have to defend and justify why art and culture are central to health society. But now I find we have to do that all the time. I'm often struck if you ask an attorney to explain why there should be a body of law, they say, of course there has to be a body of law if we're going to have a civil society. Well, I always thought art and culture had that same level. I always thought, of course, we had that, have that as a central issue within our society, a uh, central focus within our society. So the idea of, of, of having to justify and defend, uh, to restore it at the center of a healthy society, again, this is not just an arts issue. I think, again, we've seen over the last 20 years a great questioning about a number of values in our society. And the value of their, in our society should they be supported, the level they should be supported, whether that's education, health care, social services, there's a number of sectors that are going through that same exploration. So once again, art and culture is not isolated from what's going on in the rest of the environment. I think the challenge to all arts and cultural organizations, everyone committed to them, is to begin to develop those very strong arguments and communicate why arts and culture should be at the center of a healthy society. The second element in the 
in the environment that's had an enormous effect is the continued elimination of arts education from our school systems. We are now raising a generation or two of people who have gone through the school system without active arts participation. Unless there were sons and daughters of parents who made sure they had that experience in some way. And we're seeing that the cost of the elimination of arts education permeating so many parts of our lives. Uh, that, that is also by, um, it's also changed because of the elimination of arts education from our school systems. One of the things that has changed the very basic role of arts and cultural organizations, it wasn't too many years ago, the only the responsibility of arts and cultural organizations was to put art up on walls on stages. It now means that arts, arts organizations, cultural organizations have to do both. They both have to put the work up on the walls on stages, and they also must prepare the audiences. Because it was anticipated before that schools, parents, and communities would prepare the audiences, and now we have to do both. Also, all research shows when you ask an adult why they participate in arts and cultural activities, the overwhelming response is they made it as a child. There's a little bit that they attended and a little bit that they came with friends. But the overwhelming response is they made it as a child. They were in band, they were in a glee club, they took painting, they took ballet, they were in plays. They sang, they threw pots, whatever it is. And it's that making and doing which starts people on the lifelong continuum of participation. And so we've seen that eroding. And we that also this lack of arts education on school system very directly feeds back to the first, which is the role and value question. If arts, if arts education, if arts aren't valued at a healthy center of healthy society, therefore it translates right in where it fits within a school system. Um, and there's some positive change, I think, in restoring arts education. I think we're seeing some restoration of, uh, of mandates and standards and trying to get back into school systems. And in most cases, those mandates are unfunded. So again, we come back to the role and value question of where we're going to put those, those resources. Um, I think that... Uh, but I, and there's also positive in the sense of the Mozart effect. We're hearing a lot about the Mozart effect. The whole Mozart effect is that people, kids learn math better through music, which is proved, and that's fine. But that should be a byproduct. And what I think we have to do as a community <coughs> is to commit ourselves to restoring arts education, the making and doing, in every classroom, in every school, in every school system in this country. And we all have to work on that behalf to do that. Because we also see, we're also seeing some positive issues as well. So I think we're seeing more and more employers wanting employees who can work in non-hierarchical structures, who can do critical decision making, who can work in creative teams, who can work in collaboration, and discipline creativity. And that's the one thing that the arts teach and do. No other activity can do all those things. Other activities do wonderful things but not in the same way the arts do. The third, uh, the third element in the environment which is having great effect is the uh, very changing natures of attendance, of how people attend arts and cultural events. And again, we're seeing a very great change in that in the last 10 to 15 years. One measure of that change in attendance and different attendance patterns is that generally speaking around the country, subscriptions and single tickets are decreasing. They're decreasing all over the country. Uh, the reason they seem to be described that they're decreasing is a factor of time. More and more people feel they no longer have the time to subscribe or be a season, a season ticket holder. So if we think about the usual subscription, that, so in March we're usually asked to re-up our subscription, renew our subscription, and we're committing to go to the sixth show, the third Thursday in May, 12 months from now, and we don't know when we're going to have dinner with our partner this week. I think we're seeing that tension. So a lot of the, the decline is about time. It's also about money in a way, because subscriptions have, have had to increase in price. Ticket prices have had to go up a great deal, and they've had to go up because there's not sufficient contributed income. So the way to counterbalance the lack of sufficient contributed income has been to grow the ticket prices. Um, there's also the... Um, this loss of season ticket income 
is of critical importance to arts organizations because it's that subscription income that's always been made is their only cash asset. It's the line of credits, the thing that's gotten them through the next season. So the loss of that is very threatening to arts organizations. Also, the dependence on ticket, single ticket sales, it's so much more expensive to get a single ticket door. I think there, uh, there is also a perception uh, among people when they think about audiences that the audience is alone. The audience is this mass. There is this audience and the audience is alone. And if the project was just doing the work the lump wanted, then the lump would come. <laughs> and the reason the lump is not coming is because the organization is not doing the work the lump wants. What we have to understand, there is no audience out there anymore. All there is is an incredible range of fragments. And so more and more the challenge is that each arts or each and culture organization is depending upon each project it does, what are the appropriate fragments to gather around that project? And then the fragments for the next project, and the fragments for the next project. It's a very different way of thinking about audiences and how we think about audiences. Um, it also, when you talk to for people in the for-profit side of marketing, for-profit marketers, they used to talk about niches. They now talk about shards of niches. <laughs> they now talk about one-on-one -on -one relational marketing. <laughs> Arts and culture organizations, we are in the niche business. And the business of connecting those niches and how we do it is really extraordinary. Um, I believe that arts professionals, arts organizations, do a terrific job of marketing. They do a terrific job, a job with so few resources. With the few resources they have, both human and financial, they do an extraordinary job. I think in this area of audiences and audience development, um, and I've just begun thinking about this in the last several months, actually. Um, I think audience development, arts marketing, press, PR, things like that, was the area of the arts and or culture organizations that we thought we knew the most about. It's the most tangible. And we learned about direct mail and database and tracking databases and four-color brochures. We learned so much about that. And I think organizations do a terrific job of doing it. The, uh, but what we're finding, I think, now is if we're really talking about developing audiences, it may be the area we know the least about now. Because right now, when we're trying to engage new audiences, and how do we get young people back into arts, arts and culture organizations? How do we get cross-cultures functioning within our arts organizations? Uh, one of the things, and so, this, how, how do we begin to communicate? How do we make those bridges? It's the area that I think we know the least about. We're going to have to do the most experimentation is the thing that goes out past, way beyond marketing, and it's a real challenge to all of us to know how we're going to engage in audiences. It was always, a, in all the development of arts marketing, you know, there was always stated that the profile for arts and culture were middle class white people, well educated, and we were supposed to find more people like them, and that was the sort of the mantra. Today, there are an enormous amount of educated white middle class people who don't participate in art and cultural activities. So fine, so how do we make those bridges across the So I think it's a huge challenge for all of us. It's also very complex. I think too often when an organization is dealing with its earned revenue, they say, well, that's just a marketing problem. They just fix their marketing problem. It is so much more complex. It is so much deeper than that. And it's going to take such ex exploration to, uh, to move this forward. A fourth element in the environment, which is having extraordinary tech, is the very different reality and the changing reality in the lives of our volunteers and board members. As cultural and arts organizations are looking to develop new board members and maintain their board members and new volunteers, we've seen a very, very different reality in all of your lives if you're not currently already working for an arts organization. Those of us who work in arts and cultural organizations, we've always worked 60 to 80 hour weeks because we got to work in the arts. And what we find is, what we find is now most other professions now have caught up with the arts. <laughs> I wish it had gone the other way, actually. We have now, all, the other, every, all other professions are working extraordinary number of hours. The professional pressures which now people are really trying to work within. People traveling two or three days a week, no control over travel. People, uh, if there are two people in a household, they both may be in that same line. It's a very, very different environment. Uh, takeovers, downsizings, and mergers have had an extraordinarily difficult time on, well, on organizational lives, but as, as board members and as people working in arts and cultural organizations. 
where people used to, now they're doing the job that three people used to do, two people used to do. And it's a very, very different reality. Uh, uh, another I, an, organiz, uh, an organization I work with in another city, and this city is a very corporate structured community, and that city you have to have the right corporate piece and person at the right level to be the president of the board if you're going to be successful. This particular organization is in its fourth board president in three years because they got the right corporate person at the right place and through takeovers, downsizing, and mergers, people could transfer it out, whatever. This is a huge area of real exploration. Uh, it means that we have to really go back. Our, our arts and culture organizations need an extraordinary amount of help from the community. They're going to need even more help from the community, but we have to fit, totally rethink roles, relationships, decision-making, expectations between the organization and the partners in the community. This does run into a, an awful lot of mythology about what a board should, would, could do. And all this mythology about what a board should, would, could do is antithetical to the reality in people's lives. And so this is an area of rethinking all these relationships. Uh, some implications of that is that uh, we find that volunteers and board members must be very, very efficiently and effectively used. They have more, more and more people in the community are very interested in projects. They'll agree to do a project that they don't want to sign on for long-term business. We find people, uh, they, they, people become much more task and project-based than in the past. It means that there's much greater uh, dependency that the professional staffs are truly leading and directing the organizations and boards are in support of the professional staff. Um, more, more and more board members are friends. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll see if I can make it work. It's a really very different way of working and thinking than, than all the mythologies would say. About uh, as little as five years ago, maybe 50% of my work was rooted somewhere in the board area. Today it's about 70 to 80% rooted in the board area because of this change in the environment. The second part, my, my perspective on the arts and cultural life in Portland. And this perspective is informed by in fact, uh, Nancy and I moved here uh, four and a half years ago after always lived on the east. We were ready for a move and we'd been to the the Northwest and for a period of time we wandered from San Francisco to Vancouver on holidays before we wanted to move, we kept coming back to Portland. And it's been an absolutely terrific move for us. We love living here. It's just terrific. The only uh, drawback is how much I'm gone, but uh, it is a terrific place to live. And I think a lot of people I work with around the country really get sort of tired. Of getting, get tired of hearing about Portland. They say, well, how are things in Portland? Well, then they just hear all about Portland. I think they, they get to hear much more than they really wanted to do. Uh, this, uh, this, this perspective of Portland is also influenced by, I've had direct working relationships with a number of organizations in Portland, including Portland Opera, Oregon Ballet Theater, Portland Center Stage, Imago, Conduit, Chamber Music Northwest, White Bird, and, number, and some uh, and less structured relationships. And I'm very appreciative to the Meyer Memorial Trust for making a lot of these connections possible and their sort of guidance in this area. Um, my, so my view of the state and of the arts and cultural in Portland. In my opinion, there's no question but what Portland recognizes and appreciates its arts and cultural activities. I think it's very clear, great appreciation and recognition. I also believe there's no question what Portland has high expectations of what the arts and cultural organizations are going to provide in terms of quality and programs and ever desire for expanding those programs. There's no question about that. I believe there's also no question about what Portland makes, a, they recognize the significant contribution that the arts and cultural organizations make in the quality of the life that we also cherish and that's important. However, with that said, <clears throat> I find there is a great lack of understanding in Portland about the level of investment needed with contributed income to support the arts and cultural organizations that currently exist. The level of contributed income investment simply to maintain what is here, much less grow what is here. So there must be, in order to sustain and thrive, there needs to be a much higher level of contributed income coming into the arts and cultural organizations. I'm, I'm not naive, it's not easy to raise money anywhere, but I believe in Portland there is a less awareness about the need for contributed income and the level of thinking about it in terms of investment. As a result in Portland, 
every organization has this gap between what it's doing, what it's attempting to do, what's it expected to do, and the floor of financial resources represented by contributed income that's available to it. And every organization has this gap, and this gap is systemic, and it's been in place, and so people are trying to help to close that gap. There is some misperception about that gap. There are a number of people who feel, well, arts, arts and culture organizations are always having to raise money or they're in trouble because they're badly managed. That is absolutely untrue. Arts and culture organizations in this, organ in this community are very well managed. The problem is they're underfinanced. They don't have the capital to work with. And they keep doing amazing things. And they, they keep pushing that, they keep pushing further and further with such limited financial resources. They're very well managed. Uh, and arts and culture organizations like all nonprofits always need money. I mean, that's just that's the nature of the not for profit. Uh, this gap is also uh, this gap is also perceived sometimes as well. The way to close the gap is to cut the budget. We just keep cutting the budget. And why can't arts organizations downsize? Arts and all arts and culture organizations start out downsized. <laughs> We, are, we never have venture capital. We never have the capital to do program. We're always capitalizing our activities out of operating. No other business does that. And it's a struggle that we are, so to cut the budget, it also means we cut, cut, cutting the budget. There's, a, there's something in that, that there's an irreducible minimum that an organization cannot go below and still be what it is, still provide that service. So, uh, so if, if you're an opera company, you gotta have chorus and principals and, and leads and scenery and costumes and musicians and stagehands. Orchestra, you gotta have musicians. If you're a certain number of musicians, if you're a small theater, you gotta have the, the space to work in. You need all that stuff in order to do the work. And there's simply a point you cannot go below and still be that company. And that's why I think all the organizations are, are functioning, that difference between the irreducible minimum and the resources create that gap. Um, I think that um, what we find is that the organizations, the leadership, professional leadership and board leadership has been very creative and innovative in closing this gap. Uh, one way they've tried to deal with the gap is to greatly increase earned revenue and in many cases push earned revenue to where the organizations are vulnerable. Uh, and so I would, uh, that, that we all want to sell more and more tickets, but if we keep pushing earned revenue further and further, the organizations become vulnerable. One of the ways they become vulnerable is the, is the proverbial ice storm. For a large budget institution in this community, an ice storm in one or two days, they could lose $150,000 to $200,000. A small organization would be hurt just as badly. You know, the difference between a large budget organization and a small, the large has more zeros in the budget than the small ones do. But the issues are exactly the same no matter the size. So that some have tried, and, and by taking this earned revenue so high, not only vulnerable in that way, but um, it means that they've lost the ability to, to experiment with ticket pricing or audience development or trying to get new audiences in, trying to reschedule time. It's, it's been, it, it, it prevents that kind of creativity as well. An example of this ratio of earned to contributed, uh, I, uh, the, the opera in the valley in this community, in this community generally operates in about 70 to 80 percent earned, and therefore 30 to 20 percent contributed. Nationally, the average would be 50, 50, or 60, 40. Gives you some idea of the gap we're talking about in terms of the level of investment necessary. Um, some have dealt with, close, tried to deal with this gap by creating little initiatives and somehow little initiatives plug in and sort of get away for a while. And some organizations have created debt to close the gap, and some of that is financed debt and some of it is non-financed debt. We're not for debt at all. Um, and then in closing this part off, uh, we must understand that this gap will not be closed by cutting budgets. It will not be closed by earned revenue we want to sell more tickets, but that hopefully the selling of more tickets might deal with some inflationary issues that will not solve the problem. This gap will only be closed through greatly increasing the investment of contributed income. And that income must be general operating support. 
we have found again with arts and culture, both nationally and here, that the reduction of the availability of general operating support. And what organizations need is general operating support to make art, hire staff, insurance, pay the light bill, whatever it is. And we must increase the level of investment, and it must be in uh, general operating income. Also, by creating operating income, by generating operating income, having that happen, what's happened is that so many arts and culture organizations are continuing to have to create, to dream up new projects to get a little bit of money. So they keep being forced to create new projects, new projects, new projects, new projects, to hopefully get a little bit of money. And there's the danger that our arts and culture organizations, by creating project, 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 soon become a mile wide and an inch deep. And they're so quickly drawn off its center. And they're unable to really meet the needs of the community. So I, I, it's a strong, I don't know how to say it's stronger, increase the amount of contributed income, and it needs to be general operating money. If we're gonna, if we're gonna, if organizations are gonna thrive, and, and we may lose some if we don't do it. Um, the third part of the program of my presentation is there is a strategy in place to develop a venture, a philanthropy fund to begin to appropriately find, to fund this um, arts and culture organizations gap, to close the gap. And it's called the Capital Initiative Fund. It is, and it's building a sustainable cultural community for Portland, the Capital Initiative. Uh, the, the, the genesis of the Capital Initiative began a few years ago when a group of arts leaders met with the leadership of the BCA, Business Committee for the Arts, Business Committee for the Arts, and really talked about this underfunded, the need for greater capitalization, and, and how the process might be to begin to deal with this issue. Um, a process was begun, and a number of you in this room, I'm sure, participated at all along the way. And there was a, a, a group of people brought together, made up of business leaders, funders, and arts people from the arts field, to begin to develop a process. There was a fair amount of research and analysis done, and out of that came an approach to begin to address that. And this approach, it, had, it needed to have several specific things about it. It first of all needed to be specific to Portland because it is a very unique environment. It, had to be, it couldn't just be some template brought in from outside and put on top of Portland. It needed to be individually tailored to meet each organization's uh, needs, and it needed to be, it needed to have a long, it needed to be long-term and systemic. It could not be a quick fix. Organizations are very good about doing quick fixes already to deal with that gap. There was a critical point in the process when the leadership of BCA approached the city for an initial leadership contribution to create this fund. And with the leadership of former city commissioner Gretchen Kafuri, Mayor Katz, Charlie Hales, and the city council, a million dollar leadership gift was given to set up this fund. It was an extraordinary commitment by the city and the leadership of BCA to, to cause that to happen. Uh, that fund was set up with the idea it must be matched four to one by the private sector. Uh, but again, the combination of that was an extraordinary uh, commitment. At that point, uh, a new entity was created called the Capital Initiative. And the Capital Initiative was formed to, by, to, uh, to lead this process, to raise the money, to make the math, to get this program underway. The Capital Initiative uh, was formed and is led by a leadership council of seven, which I will name in a moment. Uh, it was set up independently of the BCA and RAC, the Regional Arts and Cultural Council, because of the very specific nature of its mission uh, and the mission of the other two organizations. But there's an extraordinary partnership and working supportive relationship among the Capital Initiative, BCA, and RAC. Um, the leadership group to raise this money and lead this program have an extraordinarily difficult challenge. The challenge has two parts to it. The first part of the challenge is, is explaining to the community and potential funders this concept of being underfunded, of the need for capital, of this whole thing we've talked about in the second part. It's not complicated, but it's complex. And so getting the community to understand it. So one of their first jobs has been to communicate that and get this very difficult concept to be understood. Because if a person can understand the concept, then you can go to the ask for the money. If they don't get the concept, the ask is not going to bear fruit. So it's telling that story 
uh, to the broadest possible community. The second part, the second challenge to the core leadership group of the, of the capital initiative is the money they raise must be new money. This must be new money to arts and cultural activities. This, if, because if it's simply going to rearrange the pool of money that's available to arts and cultural activities, then the very groups they're hoping to help will be harmed. Because money that goes to those organizations that already would be funded will be directed away from them. So it must be new money. I know all of you in this room at some point have or are all raising money, and you know how hard it is to raise new money. But it must be new money. Uh, they, uh, the extraordinary courage of, of a month ago, they were offered a $25,000 contribution, which they did not accept, because it would not be new money, because it was coming out of an already budgeted amount of a pool of money to arts and cultural organizations. So it's extraordinarily a challenge. The uh, current status of the TCI, the tip of, of the capital initiative, is the uh, Leadership Council is at work. They're going to expand by a few more members in the next period of time to raise even more money. At this point, they've raised a, a, a half a million dollars towards this match. And there are uh, two programs in place, and all of you have this orange color that you can read after I'm finished. Uh, you can read that gives many more details about this program. The membership, the leaders of the of the leadership, the members of the leadership council include Bud Lindstrand, Debbie Coleman, Clayton Herring, Lynn Roacker, Mary Rubel, Sharon Van Sippel, and Julie Diglin. The two staff support are Kathleen Stevenson Kuhn and Pam Baker. Um, the leadership council also has representation uh, on because you know Sharon Van Sippel is the co-chair of RAC. Um, Clayton Harry is the chair of BCA, so there's great, and then the executive director of RAC and the executive director of BCA is also on that. So it's a very comprehensive uh, group of people. Um, in conclusion, that sort of gives a snapshot, but you'll read the material, and then you can seek any of us out for more information about the capital initiative. Uh, and then in conclusion, I want to talk about just talk about two things which offer really terrific opportunities for us here in Portland and Oregon. <laughs> The first is, some of you may be aware, we may have gotten the press release or read it in the Oregonian, that uh, the Regional Arts and, Council, Arts and Cultural Council has selected its new executive director. And the new executive director is David Hudson, and he's with us today. And I think, David, you stand up and let everybody get a first crack at you. David Hudson has been the president and CEO of the uh, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Arts Council in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A distinguished history there. David, you're going to love living in Portland. <laughs> you're going to love working in this community. I think I could speak on behalf of the arts and cultural community that we're thrilled you're here. And we all look forward to working in partnership and collaboration with you to greatly improve and enhance the environment for us. So welcome. A second, uh, a second thing which I think is, offers just terrific potential and is very exciting is the culture, the statewide cultural trust. That again, a process started with the governor's task force. It's been moving along very quickly. It's coming to fruition very quickly. I believe there's some uh, legislation. There's, if you have not been a part of the presenta a presentation for the cultural trust, please be a part of that. It might be, if I may presume, it might be a terrific topic here for the city club. It's going to be just a major, they have a major impact in the state, but will have a major impact in the state. So it would really be terrific if, uh, if you can engage in that. And I know in the next period of time, all of us are going to be called upon to actively support this plan. And please, when the time comes, support the plan. It will be significant in the state. So if you want more information about it, Chris Darcy, the Oregon Arts Commission is here. I know she's been very active, Virginia Lord. A lot of people in this room have worked very actively in it, so please partake of that. It is really a, it's an extraordinary opportunity for Oregon and Portland. And uh, it just seems like it's getting very close. <laughs> so we support that. In closing, um, I would like to make, a, I think, a, a personal thank you to um, the Capital Initiative Group. This is an extraordinary group of people in the community and I read that list, and you look on the sheet. Uh, everyone in this group have been have been so central to the life of arts organizations in this community. They're so deeply committed to the arts and culture here, and they're making such a commitment to it. And there, there are people, many of also in this room, who are not on that group, they've been very active over the years, 
Bud Lindstrom was, when this very began, he was the president of the PCA. He has worked consistently and tirelessly in this to move this forward. Everyone has come in on it. Uh, a special to Kathleen Stevenson Kuhn, who again was the executive director at BC at that time, and continues to move us all forward and to do that. And I often think of myself as Kathleen's assistant. <laughs> With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much for those informative remarks. You've helped us understand that unless the arts and arts education in its many richly diverse forms are available to all our youth throughout their educational experience, that the arts will be increasingly marginalized, available only to the affluent, displaced by other quests for meaning and sensation among our youth. So my question is, how do we go about an aggressive campaign to convince our citizens, our legislature, our governing bodies in the region, our school boards, our parents, and each other, that the arts are as basic a literacy as reading and writing, and that they shape the very soul of a culture. How do we get the resources that we need for the arts on a par with those allocated to competitive sports in our culture? <laughs> Easy question, a hard question. I know I got a very hard question. Um, I think in the, in the most simple way, um, and then I'll look at that, the, what, what we have to do is deal with the role and value question first. We've got, because we, whatever we want to do, and whether it's arts education or, or whatever, or getting new facilities, whatever, we're, whatever our agenda need, whatever our agenda needs to be, we have to address the arts, the, 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 the fundamental question about arts and culture being central to a healthy society. And I, I think that, and that's something that I think we have been, uh, as a field, we have been, uh, we've not good, we've done, done a good job in that. I think we thought someone else would do it for us, the community will do it, other people will do it, we thought other people would take the responsibility for making the case, and we have not, we, we have to take responsibility for making that case. It's a complex case to make, the economic impact, is a piece of it, and there's a, there's a piece on the, the green piece on your table from uh, from uh, BCA is an example of the economic impact. But it's about values and beliefs and its aesthetics. It's such much more deeply, much more it's much deeper than that. So we we have not constructed the arguments that begin to prove and direct the case, and we have to we have to do that. I think we've waited for other people to do it. The National Endowment of the Arts could do it. They were incapable of doing it. Uh, I think it's something. Uh, we all, we, and I, I would think it's a question we, when organizations I work with, I used to ask, you know, if you took the next two board meetings and debated that topic, why do we believe arts and culture is central health side? And the board and staff debated that. But each of us has to answer that question first, and then if we could answer it in our boards and our organizations, and then if our arts councils could bring us together, and then we need to tell that story. Hi, I'm Margaret Eichmann, City Club member. Uh, I'm totally with you on your address, George, and leading up to the need that we have um, for raising private funds. The part that I think um, maybe got shortchanged in your address was the um, capital initiative solution. My, my question is really um, how creating another entity outside of our next to RAC um, helps us. And the reason I sort of ask is that, though I don't have to, can't uh, quote RAC's mission, I know it basically has to do with providing leadership and advocacy for the arts and distribution of public and private dollars to arts organizations. So I'm just curious about what, what they don't have is a really good capacity for raising a lot of private money uh, at, the, at the time. So my question is really why we would create another entity uh, since RAC is a proven leader and has public support for the way it distributes money. Well, I, I, one of the, my responses to that is, uh, and we could think differently about it, 
I believe there needs to be as many points of intersection in the community over advocacy, over distribution of funds, raising funds as possible. So I think as many, I think if we have different activities all out telling, hopefully we're all telling the same story, but we're all telling the story. So we have as many different vehicles for raising money, telling the story as possible. So I think the more voices that are raised, the healthier that it is. And that doesn't diminish anyone's role, and I think everyone's role is absolutely critical in telling that story, in raising money and distributing money. So I believe that in this case, the more voices in the community, the better. Uh, I work in too many communities where it sort of gets centralized into one voice, and that sometimes can, can limit its, the reach and its extension. So I, I believe that. I think also um, the, the, the raising of the capital money, I think, is, is, a, is a different uh, it's a different fundraising strategy and a different motivation than RAC's money and how that comes in distribution. So I, I think they do have a different mission in that way. But I can only emphasize, particularly in this last month, that the, the working together in a collaborative, sort of supporting partnership above, among three organizations is just terrific. And I think, uh, I think with David here, we have another rich resource in this, and I think all, th all three organizations working together are going to be very successful. And the, and the statewide initiative, the, the, the cultural trust, we might, there are those four, and the, the, it all fits. It's all going to move this state and city forward. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, George. Uh, my name is Brian Markovitz. I'm a city club member. I'd like to ask three follow-up questions to your discussion about the capital initiative. The first is, could you explain in a bit more detail what the fundraising strategy is, has been, or will be? Um, the second question is, once those funds are put together, how will you determine where they will be distributed and how they will be distributed to organizations in a sustainable way? And the third question I have is, for the arts organizations that you hope to help, how could we help you make the capital initiative a success. <laughs> right, let me do number three first. Um, number three, everyone can help position the, the value and the need for arts and culture in the community, and everyone can help position and sell the need for a higher level of investment through contributed income and particularly in general operating support. And the more people are out telling that story, we can't say it too many times. So that's one way in which everyone can help very directly. Um, the, fund, the fundraising, question one, the fundraising strategy, um, I would think that um, there would be people who could answer that question more effectively than I can. We can talk to our, the fundraising council, the Collins group, and Martha Richards is here as part of that. And I know that there are more than I just, I think that there is not, uh, the fundraising strategy is, uh, to sell, to get people to understand the idea. Can we get people to understand the concept? Because they can't understand the concept, they will not give money to it. So it's, it, the strategy is to get the concept out to as many people as possible, and then to try to see whether or not they'll respond. It might be in telling the story, they might go to a funder, and the funder says, oh, I get it, I see, oh, undercapitalized, wow, isn't that great? And say, but you know what? Now that I know that, I'm gonna give more money to the groups I'm already giving to. I'm not going to give it to you. That's great. That's terrific. The main thing is to get more money into the pipeline. Um, the second question was... For the organizations well, that you hope to help, how will you choose who those will be and how will it be sustainable? If, if, when, when you all get a chance after I've spoken to read the orange sheet, uh, you'll find there are two parts to it. There's a... There's a there, there, are two, there are two parts of the program, and we can talk about this in much depth afterwards. There's one which is the cultural leadership program, which is about assessment and planning that as many groups can work in as possible. And then the second part is the strategic investment program. When the, when the money is raised in the capital mission fund, the groups who have participated in the cultural leadership program then through a highly competitive process will apply for that. That second phase will, will not be able to meet a great number of organizations need. Because if you think about it, a $5 million pool, although it's sizable, doesn't begin to meet the, 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 the needs of the organization in the community. So it will enter into a highly competitive program. Thank you. I, Thank you. But we can talk more after this, because the second one is very complex. Thank you.
Uh, Tom Deering, City Club member. Uh, one of the uh, points of conventional wisdom right now is that a lot of the newly created wealth in every community, including Portland, is uh, concentrated in the high-tech industry. And that uh, people in high-tech uh, uh, are thought to be extremely focused and uh, extremely caught up in the no time to think about anything else except what they're doing. Uh, and because of that, uh, that, uh, that new wealth is much more difficult to tap and there is not as much interest in, in culture and the arts. Now, I express this as, a, as conventional wisdom because, it's like all generalities, it's not, <laughs> not entirely true. But I wonder if, to the extent that you think that that is a special challenge, and if so, what do you think that uh, uh, we ought to be doing about it, uh, both in the fundraising that you're talking about and in the fundraising that countless people in this room are concerned about too. Thank you. Um, I think it's interesting that one of the uh, members of the Leadership Council is Debbie Coleman, who has been very uh, active in that area, in that sector, and uh, is doing a lot of work on, with the Leadership Council in terms of that. That's specific for here. In general, uh, in general, um, I used to think that in the new economy and the new wealth, that the question was going to be, how can we help people understand about how to give their money and why they should give their money to nonprofit as well as the arts. I think it's more comp I've decided it's much more complicated than that. And this was informed by a, a book called um, Cyber Selfish, one written by a woman named Borsak. And what I understand is that in Cyber Selfish, um, there's a very different value system. People in the new, new wealth and new economy, there's a value about money and and wealth and about creating destruction and, a, and a, a, a whole value system which is very different than a lot of the not-for-profit about is the value is not necessarily about money, long-standing, uh, you know, of last things of lasting value. I think what we have is a very different set, set of values and what we have to do is think can we bridge the value gap first and I think that this value gap and bridging that gap is going to be much more complex than I thought it would be. Uh, I thought it was more of an educational process. I think it's going to go much before, much further than that before we get to the educational process. This is an area I think we're all spending a lot of time thinking about and trying to figure out how are we uh, going to expand. I think that um, um, I, I think we're going to see, besides the new wealth, uh, I have a, besides the, the, the new wealth that's out there, I think tax policy in these next few years are going to be really critical, how it could have either a very positive or negative effect on arts organizations. Uh, I think the, the elimination of the inheritance tax could have an enormously negative effect on arts and cultural organizations and foundations. I think there's some, also some other issues out there besides, the, besides the, 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 the new economy. Actually, I was just in working with the symphony orchestra at the last week, and we were at a round table meeting, and the, the executive director of the symphony came in and said, I got it. I know I'm going to do it. I was driving my car in. I'm going to turn the symphony into a faith-based organization. <laughs> and nutritional value, and then we ended with cars and faith base. I'm going to have to work on this one. <laughs> George, on behalf of City Club, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. There's obviously a lot to think about and a lot of work to do. We are adjourned.